Welcome to uh, OCC Online. My name is Michael Bells. And I'm one of the pastors here at OCC, a really a community church. So welcome from wherever you're watching, whatever time of day you're connecting with us, whatever platform you want. Uh, let me encourage you to uh, check out uh, OCCweb.org or our Facebook group at OCC Web for all sorts of details about what's happening here at OCC. For those of you in the Aurelia area, next Sunday, the 13th of September, will be our official regathering Sunday as we start up uh, services live in, in person. Thank you to all who've signed up to be part of the team that greets and welcomes and ushers and, and cleans and operates sound and video and projection and, and does a, a dozen other jobs that are so important. You, each one of you. Uh, as you take on those roles of welcoming people back to OCC and welcoming those who are new to OCC. Thank you. Thank you to the team that's got so many things together, whether it's welcome signs and hand sanitizer, or arranging the seating, uh, getting those little details in place. Thank you to folks who've repainted our auditorium, who've moved chairs, who've set things up for us. We are going to uh, continue to make uh, the service online, uh, available online, because we know that some of you watched from outside Aurelia, and we know that some, for a whole variety of reasons, won't be able to rejoin us in regathering, certainly not in, in the short term. One of the, the phrases we've used a lot over the last six months is grace and imagination. We need to extend grace to one another. Things will, will look different. Uh, there are some things we can't do. We, we, we can't sing. We can't greet each other by, by shaking hands or hugging. Uh, we, we have to wear face coverings. We, we can't really do OCC's kid ministry in, in person at this point. OCC Kids will be meeting via Zoom for the month of September. So check out OCC Web for, for how to connect. Also check out our, our, our website for uh, OCC Youth and, and Junior High activities. Because we can't sing, we're providing some shakers, or you can bring your own shaker so we can make some noise, a, a joyful sound to the Lord, along with the worship videos. Uh, we're going to be exploring some, some different ways of, of entering into worship with some interactive readings and video. and We, we want to make the service friendly to all ages, and Pastor Brent is working on some things, uh, uh, especially for our kids. Because the uh, health guidelines tell us we have to maintain uh, physical distancing, our seating capacity at OCC is reduced. And so you will need to register uh, by using Eventbrite, or you can simply call the, the church office and we can, connect, we can get you on the list. Ahead of time, we're going to walk you through all the things that will happen when you arrive. So watch for uh, an email from Brenda and a video that will highlight all this. In this time of COVID-19, we need grace that's full of imagination and imagination infused with grace. Imagination as we learn to do ministry and care for each other and our city in a new way in this time. As we keep rooted in being and making disciples and not just hunkering down in our bunkers. Grace. We need grace to care for one another, to accept differences, to genuinely look out for the other. To recognize that there's some with health, health restrictions. To know there are many reasons why some can't come back to a public gathering quickly. This is no time for apathetic, passive, running on the spot church going. This is a time for us, all of us, as Jesus' people to be who we are called to be. To live out the full dimensions of the effectiveness of Jesus' birth and death resurrection, and ascension. Do we know what lies ahead? No. But as we head into what is the unknown and, and may hold some danger and darkness, it's time for us to be the light of the world. May God give us an abundance of grace and imagination. But as we 
lead up to the 13th of September and even afterwards. Let's remember that we can continue to connect with each other by a phone or email, uh, Facebook Messenger, text messages. There's a whole variety of ways. Backyard, driveway visits. You know, it's not about just the Sunday morning. It's how we connect. And let's remember to pray for one another, especially as schools are reopening. And so we're going to watch a, a sh short video on praying for our schools. Today, uh, Ray and Brenda and Alan and Ryan are, are, are leading us in worship. And as we watch on video, it's easy to sit back and watch. But let me encourage you to enter in and sing with them. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome out to the house of the Lord. We're glad. We're so glad you're here with us this morning and worship our Lord and our King and our God with us. Uh, let's sing together and we'll clap our hands. We'll stomp our feet. We'll sing old choir, the old church choir this morning. Let's go. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Once you choose it, you can lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overwhelming because I've been restored. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. The valleys that I wander. The mountains that I can't climb Oh, you're with me you never leave me Oh, there ain't nothing There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy I've got an old church choir singing in my soul I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful I've got a heart overwhelming Cause I've been restored Oh, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy your feet till you find that gospel beat cause it's all you ever need all you ever need clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat cause it's all you ever need it's all you ever need i've got an old church choir singing in my soul i've got a deep salvation and it's beautiful i've got a heart overwhelmed but i've been restored no there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy 
chefs and cooking are, are big business these days, whether it's uh, uh, Gordon Ramsay, uh, Jamie Oliver, the late uh, Anthony Bourdain, uh, Mary's Kitchen Crush here in Canada. So, so, so there's so many. Um, there's a, a certain mystique uh, that's gathered around the, uh, the very top chefs. One of those top chefs is uh, Mangus Nissen. Uh, chef at Flaken in the north of Sweden. Uh, um, it's one of the world's most uh, exclusive uh, restaurants and, and one that's inaccessible uh, to, to most of us. The restaurant is um, some 600 kilometers north of Stockholm, deep in the, the forested province of Jutland. And their 32 course tasting menu requires a, a long journey, an hour's flight uh, north north of Stockholm, then a 75 minute drive uh, to, to the, uh, the location. It's about $300 US per meal. In addition to all the costs of flights and other travel with the meal taking several hours to serve. And with only 24 seats, it's become a sold-out sensation. And despite being open for nearly 10 years, only around 5,000 people have ever been there. This is food that you and I won't ever get to try. It's a meal which only the wealthy are invited to. A meal which requires you not only to have an appetite, but money, time, and the ability to get to it. And because Chef uh, Nielsen closed it last year because he wants to try it and try new things, we'll, we'll never get to, to, uh, to go there. It's a sort of place and experience that so few of us will ever have. This summer, we've been looking at some of the stories or, or parables that Jesus told. Today in uh, Luke 14, uh, we're looking at a, a couple of events where, where Jesus is at a di as a dinner guest and then um, he tells a parable. And so if Jesus is a dinner guest in the first 14 verses, then someone makes a spiritualized comment. Then in verse 16, 20 to 24, there's the parable of the great banquet. And then the chapter ends up, wraps up with the cost of being a disciple. And so let's begin in Luke 14. Uh, we begin with Jesus at a dinner party where he does some strangely offensive things. Uh, it says, one Sabbath when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. And there in front of him was a man suffering from abdominal swelling of his body. And so Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? The text says they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he, that is Jesus, healed him and sent him on his way. Jesus heals a fellow guest during the dinner and on the Sabbath, no less. And then he criticizes the behavior of everyone there. Verse 7 says, When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, he said, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and will say to you, give this person your seat. And then humiliate it you'll have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. When you're invited to a banquet, don't scramble for a high place of honor. The host might make you eat humble pie. By telling you the seat's reserved for someone worthier than you. Rather, advises Jesus, find the lowest seat in the hall so that the host, seeing your humility, moves you up the pecking order to a place of honor. It's a culture of, of shame and honor. And then, then Jesus offers some countercultural or, or some strange advice, really, on how to throw a party. Verse 12, Jesus says to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, uh, do not invite your friends. Don't invite your brothers or your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Though they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. 
You know, if this whole Sabbath supper was a, was an afternoon meal, all Jesus would have had to do was wait a few hours until sundown, until after the dessert. Then he could heal without question. There wouldn't be any problems at all. But Jesus is not safe company for a dinner party. He's certainly not pleasant company uh, for this for this party. He insults his fellow guests for, for jockeying for, to take the best social position at the table. They, they want the best spot. And then he insults the host by telling them he invited the wrong kind of people over to eat. All of which tends to, to make us see Jesus as instructing us how to act humble, how to be nice to poor people, rather than Jesus teaching about death and letting go of our desperate desire to manage our lives. Look at verse, verse 15 of Luke 14. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. You know, after Jesus has insulted the host and all his guests, this, this well-meaning person fills in the, the awkward silence with a declaration of blessing upon all who will one day dine with God. It's seen as an invitation for Jesus to uh, offer his thoughts on the great banquet at the end of all time, the, the coming kingdom. But that's not what he does. I mean, the correct answer would have been to say that those who'd kept all the rules, they would have been invited and, and, and attended the great banquet. It was likely that this unknown man had taken Jesus' instruction as a way to achieve justification by serving the poor rather than instruction to be poor in spirit and to die to self-righteousness. It's like the guest is saying, do good to get good. Blessed are those who work to earn a place at God's table. Salvation comes through winning. The price of admission to the great banquet is being a little bit better, achieving a little more than the adulterer, the murderer, or the tax collector next door. I don't need to outrun the bear, I just need to outrun you. And I can do that with just a little bit more occasional humility. Like by putting a, a little bit more money in the poor box every now and then. By, by handing out my leftovers to the homeless beggar on my way home from Sabbath dinner when I think of it. Being the very best Martha I can be. And that will put me in a position to receive the grace of God's kingdom. No. Jesus... He goes on and he ends up confusing everyone, I think, at, at the dinner party. He tells this parable, this story about a great banquet. Verse begins in verse 16. He says, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and he invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. The, the double invitation is sort of like our, our save the date notifications for a wedding and, and then the official invitation that comes a little bit later. Lots of people had been invited, but all these people, they had excuses. It says verse 18, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. In verse 19, another one said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Verse 20, another one said, I just got married, so, how, so I can't come. And then Jesus says, the man was angry at all the refusals, all the turning down of this invitation. And then the story turns on its head because the answer to the host's anger is grace. He decides to open up the banquet to those who weren't expecting to be allowed in. And the servant goes out and offers the unlikely guests, the, the, the poor, the, the, the crippled, the, the, the blind and, and the lame, a chance to come in to the banquet. Verse 21, the servant come, came back and reported to his master and, and the owner of the house became angry, it says, and he ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town, bring in the poor, bring in the crippled, bring in the blind, bring in the lame. In verse 22, the servant says, Sir, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. And then the master tells his servant this. He says, go up to the roads and, and the country lanes. Go, go up further. Compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. 
the servant again is sent out to it says compel guests to come in not by force but by persuasion since the offer was was so radical the man was inviting passing strangers to eat a banquet with him you know just what is Jesus suggesting here? Is he proposing a, an ethnic division, Jews and Gentiles, or a, a financial separation based on your, your, your money? Is he implying that we shouldn't eat with family or friends? I think more than any of these, any of these factors, it seems to me to be about the totally unexpected nature of the kingdom of God. God isn't primarily interested in attracting the winners. God's not primarily interested in att attracting the, the cultural influencers, the celebrities, the brightest and the best, or even the friends and the family of the banquet host, who, who would no doubt have been wealthy, than wealthy and successful themselves. No, God is primarily concerned with inviting those who appear to be losers, According to uh, the priest and theologian uh, Robert Farrow Capon, who was also a chef, he, he writes, None of the people who had a right to be at a proper party came, and all of the people who came had no right whatsoever to be there. Which means, therefore, Capon writes, that the one thing that has nothing to do with anything is rights. This parable says we're going to be dealt with in spite of our deservings not according to them. Grace, as portrayed here, Capon says, works only on the untouchable, the unpardonable, and the unacceptable. It works, in short, by raising the dead, not by rewarding the living. What a, what a challenging but, but refreshing vision. A banquet is taking place right where we are, open to all, but only as long as as we realize we don't deserve it. In the banquet parable, all of those on the original guest list have sensible, they've got legitimate, they've got good reasons why they cannot attend. You know, inspecting newly purchased property is, is good business practice. Test driving your new fleet of oxen is important. Being on your honeymoon is a very reasonable justification for declining a party invitation. But Jesus says the master of the house became angry. The host is angry because this just isn't any old party. This is like a, an invitation to dinner at the, the prime minister's house, followed by a night at the Academy Awards, followed by the governor's ball, plus a dinner dance with all the world's kings and queens in attendance. It's the kind of party that any of the best people would be willing to do just about anything to attend because blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But those invited in the great banquet parable are way too busy living their reasonable lives to even consider dying to their plans in order to join the real party. The, the worthiness or, or worthlessness of the alternative guest list, the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame doesn't drive the invitation. It's the host's compulsiveness to fill up his house is his slow soul motivation. The reason for dragging what many would see as the riff-raff of humanity into the party is not because of pity for their plight or, or some sort of phony admiration for their lowliness, but simply the fact that this host has decided he has to have a full house. And so grace here is not depicted as, as a response. Above all, it's not depicted as a, as a fair response or as a, an equitable response or as a proportionate response. Rather, it's shown as a crazy initiative, a radical discontinuity. This isn't a, a, a right-side-up solution that the host offered to salvage the party. The host's plans for his great party have been shipwrecked by a list of reasonable responses, by, by reasonable people who refuse to die to their reasonable plans for successful living. And so the host chooses instead to throw a different kind of party. He creates the kind of party his initial reasonable guests would never be caught dead attending. The kind of party a respectable person or a respectable older person, as Jesus highlights in, in the next chapter, 
would refuse to enter because being dead is the only ticket to the supper of the Lamb. And so Jesus leaves the parable hanging. He doesn't explain it. Luke doesn't record any discussion from the guests. It just sort of sits there. But then, a short time later, as Jesus is traveling, um, we, we, we find the next few verses, Jesus saying, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. See, grace operates only by raising the dead. The judgment pronounced will be based only on our acceptance or rejection of our resurrection from the dead. Everybody is raised up in the final judgment. Nobody's kicked out for having a rotten life because it's only the life of Jesus that matters. But of course, tragically, there'll be plenty of older brothers waving their books around, trying to prove they never died in the first place. There is a place for such party poopers. God thinks of everything. He casts them away. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 1, uh, beginning in verse 7. It says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and all understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan who works plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Father God, we thank you that you invite people like us to your great banquet. Father, help us to be so thankful and to recognize it's because of your grace, not because of all the anything that we've ever done. But Lord, help us to be people who communicate, who demonstrate, who live out that grace and make room for others, not on the basis of what they've done, but on the basis of your great love. And so we say thank you, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you feel the broken we do. do you feel the shadows deepen we do do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new All creation groaning it is. is a new creation coming it is. is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this Worthy, is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah conquered the grave. He's David's is root and the Lamb who died to ransom the saved. Is he worthy? Does 
the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone home? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The grave is David's and the man who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe to every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Oh, bless 